So now that we have a little intuition about sampling, we realize there are kind of good ways to do sampling and bad ways to do sampling. Let's actually go through and start rigorously figuring out the proper way to do sampling to make sure that we capture all of the information in the original signal. And the way that we're going to do that is with this concept of impulse sampling. And this picture down here on the bottom depicts what I mean by that. Starting with some continuous time signal, which has an infinite number of values that we would need to write down, right? There's just a continuum of values there in time that we would need to write down. We are going to turn this into a signal that only has a finite number of values by multiplying it by an infinite impulse train. So we're going to perform impulse sampling by multiplying our continuous time signal by this infinite impulse train, resulting in this signal here. So this is still a continuous time signal, but you can see that it's been transformed into one that only has a finite number of values now. Each one of these impulses is just one number we would need to write down, and they're spaced periodically in the time domain. So we've gone from this thing, this continuous time signal x of t that has an infinite number of values to write down, to this impulse sampled signal that only has this countably finite, either, either finite or countably infinite, number of values to write down. So we've accomplished our goal of discretizing the time domain and getting a sampled signal. So what happens when we actually do this mathematically? Let's go ahead and work on that. So let's let x of t be a continuous time signal, just like in that picture. If x of t is the time domain signal, that means that it has a frequency domain representation of x of omega. So x of omega is just the Fourier transform of x of t. And what we're going to do is we're going to do impulse sampling. So what does it mean to impulse sample x of t? Well, it means to take x of t and multiply it by that pulse train. So we're calling that pulse train p of t. And this results in the impulse sampled signal x sub delta of t. So we use this subscript delta to indicate that this is a continuous time signal, but it's one that has been impulse sampled. It's been multiplied by p of t. And before we had the picture for p of t, but we can actually write down mathematically what p of t is. p of t is just an infinite collection of impulses, all at multiples of t sub s. So if I had to write down the mathematical equation for p of t, this infinite summation is what p of t is equal to. And we just plotted this on the previous page, but I'll go ahead and sketch it here, just so we know what we're talking about. p of t is this signal, just an infinite impulse train. Let's think about this equation in the frequency domain. So instead of thinking about impulse sampling in time, let's think about what happens to this in the frequency domain. So let's transform this equation term by term into the frequency domain. So on the left hand side, x delta of t turns into x delta of omega. That's equal to x of omega convolved with p of omega. So remember in the time domain, I have multiplication, that means I have convolution in the frequency domain. That's one of our Fourier transform properties. And when you go from multiplication in time to convolution in frequency, this scale factor of 1 over 2 pi also pops up. This is part of the property. So in the frequency domain, we can think about it as this relationship. So this is the time domain version of impulse sampling. This is an equivalent frequency domain representation of impulse sampling. And this is how we're going to think about the problem here going forward. So the question we have now is, what is p of omega? I know what p of t is. It looks just like this. What is p of omega? What is the frequency domain representation of p of t? So let's work on that for a minute. The Fourier transform of an infinite impulse train. So p of t is this equation. It's just an infinite collection of time-shifted impulses. p of t is periodic. It has a period of t sub s. It just repeats for forever in the time domain. So since this is a periodic signal, that means when we want to represent it in the frequency domain, we have to represent it with its Fourier series representation, because it's a periodic signal. Its fundamental frequency is 2 pi over its period. Its period is t sub s, so its fundamental frequency is omega naught equals 2 pi over t sub s. And now I can go ahead and just compute the Fourier series coefficients to figure out the frequency domain representation of this signal. So this equation right here for p of k 
is just the equation for the Fourier series coefficients. You always put a 1 over the period out front. When you integrate, you integrate over a full period. Since my period is t sub s, I'm integrating from minus t sub s over 2 to t sub s over 2. That's one full period. I put the signal right here, and then I multiply it by e to the minus j k omega naught t dt. That's just the definition of how you compute the Fourier series coefficient. And for this particular problem, since on the interval minus t s over 2 to t s over 2, we have an impulse, we have an impulse right here. This equation actually is really easy to evaluate because this turns into just using the sifting property of the impulse. So when I do this integral, this impulse here sifts out the value of this function at the location of the impulse. So here is the function, and the location of the impulse is t equals 0. This impulse is located at time equals 0. So this integral, using the sifting property, is very easy to do and we just have to evaluate this expression at time equals zero. Well, e to the zero is one, so this just turns into one over t sub s. So this equation is actually very simple. There is no dependency on k. All of the Fourier series coefficients, all p sub k for k equal minus infinity to infinity, all are just a number, and that number is one over t sub s. So now that we know what all the Fourier series coefficients are, we can actually write down the Fourier series representation of this signal. So we just write down our equation. It's 2 pi, the sum from minus infinity to infinity of p sub k, delta of omega minus k omega naught. So this is just the definition of the Fourier series representation of the signal. And now that I've figured out what p sub k's are, I can plug in what they are. It's just 1 over t sub s, so I brought the 1 over t sub s out front. And this is my... Um, Fourier series representation of P of T. In the frequency domain, it looks like just another infinite collection of impulses. If I plotted this, we have all these impulses. They're spaced at omega naught, but it's still just an infinite collection of them. So this is very interesting. The Fourier transform of an infinite impulse train gave us an infinite impulse train. So that's kind of interesting. But now we know what p of omega is. We can return to our previous calculation that we were working on to understand what the Fourier transform of our impulse sampled signal is. So let's go back to our equation. We had that x sub delta of omega, the Fourier transform of our impulse sampled signal, was equal to 1 over 2 pi x of omega convolved with p of omega. And we've spent the last few minutes trying to figure out what p of omega is. Now that we know what it is, we can actually plug in for it. So we have 1 over 2 pi, x of omega, convolved with 2 pi over t s, the sum k equals minus infinity to infinity of these impulses. So this might look kind of intimidating, but it's not. What we're doing here is we have an infinite collection of impulses being convolved with some underlying x of omega. If you remember how to do convolution, convolving with an impulse is really easy. When you convolve with an impulse, all you do is take a shape and place it at the location of the impulse. Since I have a whole bunch of impulses, I'm just going to do that a whole bunch of times. I'm going to take x of omega, and I'm going to place it at every single location of the impulse. Mathematically, that means I'm going to end up with an infinite collection of x of omegas located at the location of the impulse. So mathematically, it turns into this equation, and the two pi's have canceled. 2 pi divided by 2 pi is 1 but this is the final answer that I get. So I have that the Fourier transform of my impulse sampled signal is equal to this. So this isn't too hard to, to analyze. There's just this scale factor, so 1 over Ts is just a number out front. And then I have this term, which is just an infinite collection of shifted versions of my original spectrum. So if you know what your original spectrum looks like, maybe it looks like a triangle or a rectangle or some sync function, after you do impulse sampling, you end up with those shapes shifted up and, up and down the frequency axis. And they're shifted up and down at multiples of the sampling frequency, omega s, and integer multiples of omega s. So we now have this nice equation, x delta of omega, that lets us know what the Fourier transform of the impulse sampled signal is, and we can use this to analyze what happens when we do impulse sampling in the frequency domain, and it's going to tell us the right way and the wrong way
to do sampling. And we'll do that in the next video.